Like Milton's hero in Paradise Lost, who happens, by the way, to be the evil one himself, it behooves me now to use both oar and sail to gain my port. John Ludyard wrote that prior to leaving London, but to me, it applies all the same to the autumn sailing down the Lena River, the 11th longest river in the world. Along with the shipmate Adam Laxman, they embarked in late summer, making 80 to 100 miles a day. The river, as Jared Sparks puts it in his biography on Ledyard, quote, gradually increasing in size, and the mountain scenery putting on an infinite variety of forms, alternately sublime and picturesque, bold and fantastic, with craggy rocks and jutting headlands, bearing on their brows the verdure of pines, firs, larches, and other evergreens, and alpine shrubs. All the way to Yakutsk, the river was studded with islands, recurring at short intervals, which added to the romantic effect of the scenery, and made the voyage down the Lena, notwithstanding its many privations, by no means an unpleasant trip to a true lover of nature and a hardy veteran traveler. End quote. After a few hundred miles, their sail broke. Ledger writes, quote, My rascal of a soldier stole our brandy and got drunk and was impertinent. I was obliged to handle him roughly to preserve order. End quote. The sail fixed, they continued down the Lena, as La Perouse was sailing toward Avacha Bay in Kamchatka. Ledyard arrived in Yakuz 16 days later, on the 18th of September. As Sparks writes, quote, When he left Irkutsk, it was just in the middle of harvest time, and the reapers were in the fields. But when he entered Yakutsk, the snow was six inches deep, and the boys were whipping their tops on the ice. End quote. Welcome to Expeditions, a podcast around Lewis and Clark. We explore the history and historiography of the expedition one day at a time. We are everywhere at Expeditions Pod, social media, Patreon if you want to support the show, as well as our website. You are currently in Mile Marker 2, episode Between Scylla and Charybdis. Determined to not lose another winter, Ledger made plans to head toward Okust, the Russian base for Pacific expeditions since it was first reached in 1639. However, Ledyard was discouraged, though not prevented, by the commandant, Grigory Markolovsky. What, alas, shall I do, he lamented in his journal. It's not that he wouldn't want to winter in town instead of trudging through piercing wind chills, but it came down to money. Quote, How many of the noble-minded have been subsidiary to me or to my enterprises, yet that meager demon poverty has traveled with me hand in hand over half the globe and witnessed what? The tale. I will not unfold. End quote. Ledger couldn't have known this, but the governor of Irkus, Ivan Iacobi, suspected him of being a British spy for fur trading interests and sent a secret message to Markolovsky for him to stall in order to investigate. In the meantime, solemnly, John Ledger submitted to the weather, quote, It is certainly bad, in theory, to suppose the seasons can triumph over the efforts of an honest man. End quote. John Ledyard is somewhere in Yakutsk, where I'm sure many of you listening have never been to, nor have a perfect city map in late 1786, so we're going to have to invent somewhere that John Ledyard is, an inn, a diner, a bar, the home of the confidant, or the city's elite. Our reasoning is to try to get at something some of us may have experienced before in our lives, either being reminded of home in a faraway place, or meeting a friend on the other side of the world. This wouldn't be John Ledyard's lowest moment, but prior to our dramatic reveal, imagine how lonely it would be if you were transported right now to the literal other side of the world. Not even the natural world was giving him much to look forward to. Quote, I have seen but one aurora borealis, he writes, one of the most beautiful natural phenomena in the world. But according to Ledyard, quote, not an extraordinary one, end quote. But he hung in there until November 1786. What fate intends is always a secret, Ledger wrote prior to Siberia. Fortitude is the word, and it's always in those moments when the door finally opens and you can hardly believe who you're seeing. It had been seven years since the Cook expedition ended and the men were scattered in the wind. 
we know of John Ledyard to this point, but one of the able seamen, the one who arrived, Joseph Billings, had joined the Russian Navy in October of 1783. This was an era when nationalities were more fluid, nation states as we know them were not as entrenched. We'll revisit this idea as we head toward the Illinois country with Lewis and Clark. Martin Sauer, Billings secretary and translator, wrote in 1802, quote, In Yakus we found to our great surprise Mr. Ledyard, an old companion of Captain Billings and Cook's voyage around the world. He then served in the capacity of corporal, but now called himself an American colonel, and wished to cross over to the American continent with our expedition for the purpose of exploring it on foot. End quote. If Ledyard didn't know that Billings had joined the Russian Navy, his being in Yakutsk would suddenly make a whole lot more sense than Ledyard. One can only imagine Billings trying to piece together his last few years and how they led him here, now. For Billings' part, he would explain that he was in the far north, where the river Kolima meets the Arctic. He and Officer Gavriel Sarichev attempted to sail east out of the port, but were stopped by ice. The prospect of wintering that far north wasn't appealing, and besides, he was transferring the shipbuilding to Akust. One wonders if Ledyard asked if the road there had really been that dangerous this time of year. I mean, Billings kind of just did a version of this. How much he shared exactly what he had been doing for the Navy is unknown. One can assume that he could open up to Ledyard. What danger could that prove, though? Events in the future, as well as Ledyard being stalled there, may have affected the pair's reunion. What Billings could have told Ledyard was that as La Perouse set sail in 1785, Catherine II, as awed by Cook's voyages as the next monarch, tapped Billings, who was also friends with George Pallas, whom Ledyard had met in St. Petersburg, on an expensive, extensive voyage to stake claims to territories across the Arctic, the Bering Sea, and into Alaska. According to Donald Jackson, quote, there was little time for Russia to lose, despite her running start in the fur trade. By August of 1785, British seaman James Hanna had reached Nootka Sound, and the Americans were on their way. End quote. Billing's instructions for his upcoming expedition were based on those that Peter the Great had given to Captain Vitus Bering, and, like La Perouse's instructions, would have been instantly recognizable for Jefferson in his instructions to Lewis. Billings was to determine the latitude and longitude at the Colima across the sea, chart any and all islands, observe geography and electrical phenomena, along with other meteorological effects, obtain specimens of natural life, as well as produce drawings of native people and their material lives. Like La Perouse and Lewis and Clark, the expedition was to be peaceful under all circumstances, and Billings could select all officers and privates that he wished to accompany him, including, if possible, John Ledyard. No expedition was ever more liberally provided, and none ever commenced under better auspices, Jared Sparks wrote. The closest would have been Bering's famous second voyage from 1733 to 43, where he and his crew mapped the Siberian coast, discovered Alaska, though Semyon Desnev would like a word, and the Aleutian Islands, and determined that there was no continent in the Pacific. The impetus for that expedition was, like so many others of that era, commercial and scientific. While the cultural enlightenment czar Peter the Great, who had died before Bering's triumph, wished to embody was well and good, the furs that returned with Bering led to a foundational shift in Russian economic life. Like North America by the end of the 19th century, Siberia was going through a drastic decline in its fur trade from overhunting sable, otter, and silver fox at the close of the 17th. As Russia was becoming more European, that meant their colonial era was just beginning. Russians slowly moved across the Aleutian Islands. Cook, along with Ledyard and Billings on that third expedition, encountered Jerisim Ismailov on Unalaska in 1778. He traveled with Grigory Shelikov to Three Saints Bay on Kodiak Island, where in 1784, they slaughtered thousands of Aleutic people, giving them not only a permanent base in Alaska, but also a subjugated people. As Catherine would say in 1788, quote, much expansion in the Pacific Ocean will not bring solid benefits. To conduct trade is one thing, to take possession is another. That would never fully happen. In time, we will explore the Russian-American company, Alexander Andreevich Baranov, 
Nikolay Petrovich Rezanov, etc., when we find ourselves down at the coast with Lewis and Clark. The era of Russian America effectively ended in 1867 when they sold Alaska to the United States for two cents an acre. As the two caught up over the past few years, Shirley Ledger reiterated his own experience at Nootka Sound, going off with two native guides, quote, With me, some presents adapted to the taste of the Indians, brandy and bottles and bread, but no other provisions. I went entirely unarmed by the advice of Captain Cook, end quote. And meeting roughly 30 Russians who gave Ledyard aid and assistance and let them see their boat, which was, quote, the same in which the famous Bering had performed those discoveries, which did him so much honor and his country such great service, that I was determined to go on board of her and indulge the generous feelings that the occasion inspired, end quote. If everyone was enjoying the camaraderie, would be perfectly understandable, but as the rest of Billings' crew prepared for the next move, they surely were wondering if this American colonel, as he put it, would be coming along for the ride. After a hundred days at sea and a few close calls, La Perouse and crew arrived in Macau, given to the Portuguese for perpetuity off of the South China Sea. Here they sold furs that they had taken from Alaska as well as engaged Chinese mariners to make up for those losses at Latua Bay. From there they sailed to Manila, engaging once again with Spanish governance. After losing a man to dysentery, repairs were made to the ships and on April 9, 1787, they sailed out of Cavett Harbor toward Russia. La Perouse passed Korea and Japan, two mysterious countries since they had kicked the Portuguese out of there in 1640, charting the southwest of Honshu. The north had been charted by Captain Cook. The crew headed towards Sakhalin, which, unlike Baja, hadn't been charted and wasn't clear to La Perouse if it was an island or a peninsula. Obtaining a map from the local Ainu people, he wanted to sail through the narrow strait of Tartary, but predicted that he would end up in a sandbar. Between Scylla and Charybdis, he sailed around to another strait, which future mariners changed from Frenchman's to La Pelouse, though the Japanese still call it Soya Strait. Due to fog, La Perouse complained that it had, quote, taken 150 days to explore a part of the coast which Captain King supposed might be examined in the course of two months. End quote. They passed much of the Kuril Islands, a chain from Japan to Kamchatka, separating the Pacific Ocean from the Sea of Okust. On September 7th, 1787, the crew prepared for a few months of rest as it anchored in Petropavlovsk, where Bering himself is said to have founded the town in 1740. The last Europeans to have sailed into the port wrote the resolution and the discovery after Cook's death. Mm-hmm.